the Apostle Paul said that he desired one thing and that's it. And what was it? To know Messiah crucified. Now, when he said that, he was not speaking from an intellectual standpoint. It wasn't about knowledge. No, that word no is in regard to experience. What Paul was saying was this, that he wanted to know the power of the cross. Because it's only when you have an experience with the cross, then and only then are you going to be delivered, set free, empowered to walk with God, to experience Him, to manifest His glory, and be a powerful vessel in His hand. To get your Bible, and look with me to the book of Luke, and once again, chapter 23. Luke's Gospel in chapter 23. Now, we concluded our afternoon session with Pontius Pilate giving in to their desire. Not concerned about righteousness. Not concerned about justice. But thinking what is best for him. And we learned something. When I make decisions what I think is best for me, it's the exact opposite. It's only when I listen to God, hear from Him, follow His Word, and do what is right in His sight, then and only then am I making a proper decision, one that is God-honoring, God-serving. So what Paul was saying is this, that he wants to have a Jacob spirit. You heard me right. A Jacob spirit. Now, what do I mean by that, and how is that tied to the cross? Well, you might remember Jacob. He returns back out of exile. He had his family, this large family, with him. He knew that he was going to meet Esau. And he went and got alone, and he prayed. And he found himself wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And you remember what he did? He would not let go until God blessed him. See, that's what the cross does. It gives us the desire to hold on, not to let go until God's will is fulfilled, until we experience the outcome of the cross, and that is the kingdom. See, you cannot have the kingdom without the cross because the cross represents a perfect redemption. Now, the cross fulfills the Torah. What do I mean by that? Well, you look some time at Deuteronomy 21, and it says, Cursed is the man who's hung on the tree. And that curse that he received, it brought about a great change. It paid the price in full for sin. Whose sin? All sin. And it enables us, it positions us where we can find blessing from God. See, with the sin debt paid, with the cross payment, we can experience the life and the blessing that is only found in the kingdom but we who walk with that kingdom character, we can begin to have a foretaste of that. And it was because that Messiah knew that, that he went through what we're going to talk about tonight. Look at verse 27. Luke chapter 23 and verse 27. There was this large multitude of people and women that followed after Yeshua. Now, what had taken place? Well, Luke tells this story up until now very quickly. He leaves out much of the suffering of Messiah. That he was beaten by, by soldiers that were assigned to the Sanhedrin at the house of Caiaphas. He was then transferred to Pontius Pilate. And remember, we talked about this this afternoon. 
When Pontius wanted to punish him severely so that the leadership would say, that's enough. We don't require any more. And one of the most telling statements in the account of the Gospels is after Yeshua was flogged, Pontius Pilate brought him out and he said, Behold the man. Now, why did he say that? See, that is in the form of an oath. He said that on the judgment bema. What he was saying, he was testifying that he wasn't making a switch. That this man who had been beaten beyond recognition, see, he was saying, this one that you gave to me, this is him. Because they couldn't recognize him from the pain and the torture that had been afflicted upon him. And it was after suffering all of this that the crucifixion began. And so here in verse 27, Yeshua, he's on the way to the cross where he's going to lay down his life. And it's in that journey that we find a great multitude, but what's emphasized once more is women. Why women? It gives us that context. It reveals to us that this has a redemptive aspect to it. That Messiah's death, everything about the cross is for the purpose of redemption. And we learned last night that it's Passover, which is the festival of redemption, And that's what day all of this is happening upon. So this multitude of men and women, but when we keep reading, when it says they, by the way, that's in the feminine form. It's the women who are lamenting. It is the women who are bemoaning what is taking place to Yeshua. And it's in the midst of their tears, in the midst of their cries, their screams. Notice how he responded. He says in verse 28, turning to them, here again, in the feminine, only to the women, Yeshua said, daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the term daughter, from a rabbinical standpoint and biblical standpoint, it speaks about a future. It speaks about the next generation. So he says, daughters of Jerusalem. He's revealing something that's going to happen in the near future, 40 years later. He says, do not cry for me, but rather for yourself cry and for your children. Now, according to the prophets, there is a very important term we need to learn. And that is the next generation. When we speak about the children. Let me give an example of what Judaism says. Now, we sung the Shema. And up there, there's the words. You know, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And these things which I command you today, let them be upon your heart. So the question is, How do I live that out? Where does it begin? And the answer is this. By teaching the next generation. By teaching diligently your sons. So when someone fulfills that, when someone is concerned about the next generation, it has a a kingdom interpretation. So many places when the scripture speaks about the next generation, it's talking about that kingdom hope. That redemption fulfillment. And what Yeshua is saying here is, you don't have that. Because what's coming now because Israel has rejected their king. Israel doesn't have that vision, that right expectation. So he says, you know, don't mourn for me. Don't have tears for me. Because what's coming upon you in this next generation, that's where you need to cry. He says, keep reading in verse 29, because behold, the days are coming when you will say, 
Blessed are the barren ones and the wombs that did not give birth and the breasts that did not nurse. Then began to say to the mountains, fall upon us and to the hills, cover us up. Now, when we speak about mountains and hills falling upon us, hiding us, that is a reference we see it prophetically and also in the book of Revelation. We see that phrase as foreshadowing the wrath of God. God's judgment, His fierce anger. And that's what He says is coming upon Israel. Because of their rejection, our rejection of God's provision. See, the cross always shows shame. The shame that we have that was placed upon Messiah. And because of that, well, things are going to get very difficult. Now, in our next lesson tonight, we're going to be talking about the resurrection. We're going to learn that there's always, always a connection between resurrection and kingdom. But in order to get to that resurrection, there's that cross. There's that death. And there's going to be a transformation. And we see how in this prophetic passage. And this section of Luke is prophetic. He says to the daughters of Jerusalem. He's speaking to the women. He's speaking about those who believe that the future is going to be bright. And he says, no, it is going to be dark. And we'll see just how dark in a few minutes. So as he says these words, notice verse 31. He says, now, if they will do these things, when the tree is, literally it's the word water, so we would say moist. Some Bibles might say green. Literally it's a word for moist. Meaning in a fruitful time. If, if the world behaves like this in a good season, Messiah is here. God is visiting his people. He is manifesting his power. All these things that they had witnessed for Three years, remember the number three. It documents, it confirms, it reveals. All of God's pleasure, his good love, his power was manifested to and through Yeshua. And how did the people respond? By crucifying him. And he says, if they do such things in the moist season, at a good time, we'll keep reading he says, what will they do when it's dry? Now, when a tree is dry, it's very susceptible to fire. A dry tree, it is an idiom to say, the wrath is coming. Because God has promised, we know this, he's not going to destroy the world again, correct? No. He's going to destroy the world, not with a flood, but with fire. And when we look at the book of Revelation... We see, and don't make the mistake of so many people, who look at Revelation and chapter, for example, 16, and they see these horrible things happening, and they try to put them into human terms. Oh, this must be a nuclear war. Oh, this may be that, that new type of helicopter. And they want to explain it in our terms. When the whole purpose of what God is describing is to say all these things, their origin is not man, it's not technology. Their origin is they're all falling from where? Heaven. God is manifesting himself in an undeniable way. What is going to take place in the last days? There's no other explanation than God is angry. I realize People don't like to come to conferences and hear about an angry God. But if you are prophetically literate, if you understand where this world's going to, we are approaching the wrath of God. Many things have to happen previously. But the wrath of God is a reality. And you know how I know that so well? 
Because I understand the cross. If God, who is perfect, who loves, who is gracious and merciful and holy, but because he's all those things, he also, he is wrathful. He loves righteousness. He hates unrighteousness. He is willing to forgive sin, but if we don't take his provision, he will judge and consume sin eternally. So when I understand the cross, it confirms a vengeful God, a God of anger, a God of wrath. Here again, not popular, won't sell a lot of books, but the cross, the cross testifies It displays the anger of God for sin. So look again. Verse 32. And they led two others. And these two others are criminals. Now, it's very significant, the word here for other. In the Greek language, you have two words. That means other. It can mean others of the same type or others of a very different type. And here, it means of a different type. These are two people who have been condemned to the cross, but they're very different from Yeshua, and we'll see why in a few minutes. Verse 33. And when they went away to the place, and that place, now, I believe the King James calls it Calvary. But in the Greek, it is a word for skull. Some people will say that 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 hill there looks like a skull, and it did. Others will say that it represents, and I reject this, Because they'll say that, no, it's because there were numerous skulls there from death. No. What would the Jewish community always do? Bury the bones. Unclean. We don't let them lie around. So it's called the skull because the place resembled it. And it's there they crucified him and those two other criminals. One was on the right And one was on the left. Now, these details are important. Because these details reveal to us that this isn't some story. It's not some myth. It's not some legend. These details are a way of saying it's fact. It's history. And Yeshua, in the midst of being crucified. Now, crucifixion is synonymous with pain. And we know something. Any doctor would tell you, as someone suffers more, he thinks more about himself. That pain that he's experiencing causes all of his being to think of himself and not others. Not so with Yeshua. Because when he was being crucified, notice what he says. He speaks to his father. And he says, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They don't understand this. They have been blinded by what? Well, keep reading. It says, and they divided his garments. So this gives us a way of understanding the text. Rightly getting to the proper interpretation. Messiah is thinking not of himself. He says, forgive these people. And what we see an example of what all people were thinking. And that is, how can I profit from my current situation? And these soldiers, what were they doing? Dividing his garments. Casting lots to see who would receive them. And as this was going on, the people who were standing and perceiving this, what were they doing? Well, it says, they and the rulers, they were mocking, mocking him, and saying, others 
he's saved. But himself, if he is truly the Messiah, the chosen one of God, let him save himself. Now, Yeshua, he had the power to come off that cross. He could have ended it at any time, but he didn't. That which he began, he was faithful to complete. See, when Paul says that I might know Messiah and him crucified, desiring to know that power of the cross, it is the ability to preserve and persevere to the very end. Not to ever turn back. What does Messiah say? If someone puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not worthy to what? The kingdom of God. So when we have that power of the cross, we're going to persevere. Messiah says, verse 36, this chosen one of God, they are mocking him, these soldiers, and they're coming before him, and they're bringing some vinegar. Now, the word here for vinegar implies something that is bitter. Now, Luke kind of glances over this, but there's some significance. See, if you look, for example, in the book of Numbers in chapter 9, it talks about Passover, the second Passover. And we find there that there is a requirement for the matzah and the Passover lamb and the bitter herbs to be consumed together. Well, we know that Yeshua, John says, behold, he's the lamb. He's also that bread of life. He's the matzah, that unleavened bread without sin. And we see in the other gospel, he cries out. And they give him that, that vinegar wine, that bitter wine, as a way of fulfilling the Passover. That is paying the full price for redemption. And they continue to mock, saying, if you are the king of the Jews, verse, verse 37, then save yourself. Verse 38, and it was written in letters above him, both in Greek, says Roman or Latin, and in Hebrew. There is a declaration, declaration that this one is the king of the Jews. And that term, king of the Jews, it's synonymous with Messiah. Verse 39. And one of the criminals that were hung, he began to blaspheme him. Now, how would you like the last thing that you did, you're hanging on this cross, and the one that can save your soul, you're blaspheming. You don't get it. And it's to tell us that even on the cross, he is enduring rejection, both from the leaders of Israel from the soldiers and even from those criminals. But notice, he says in this passage of Scripture, he begins to blaspheme and says, if you are the Messiah, save yourself and, here's his real interest, and us. But the other one, he answered, and he rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Because you are in this same punishment. And we, it is just, because we have performed unjust things. And we were receiving what is proper. But this one, he has done nothing, and it's the simplest language, he has done nothing wrong. So we have that proclamation, declaration that Yeshua is innocent. Pilate, he said it, but he wouldn't act upon it. And the same one says, verse 42, he says to Yeshua, remember me, don't miss this next word, what is it? Lord. 
Now, in another gospel, both of those criminals cursed him. But one had a change of heart. You know what that tells me? It's never too late. As long as you still have breath within your mouth, it's never too late to repent and to acknowledge Yeshua as Lord. And when we do, even though he was guilty, he deserved to die, notice the response. He says, remember me in your kingdom. And Yeshua says, verse 43, Yeshua responds, truly I say to you, today. Now just think about these two criminals. One that blasphemed him to his death, and the other one who repented and asked to be remembered. On that day, wow, are they going to have two so different experiences. This one who says, remember me, he had no good deeds. There was no works that accompanied that proclamation. But there was a sincere heart. And aren't you glad that God looks to our heart and not always to our deeds? So he says, remember me. And Yeshua says, truly I say to you, and the emphasis is today. Today, and it's choppy in the language. He says simply, with me. Now, that word, with, well, if you were to ask an Orthodox rabbi, what is the redemptive name of Messiah. That is to say this. What name of Messiah teaches us most about him being the Redeemer? You know what they would say? Emmanuel. Because that phrase means literally, with us, God. And the only way that a holy God can be with sinful people is by means of redemption. So when Yeshua says, today, with me, you shall be in paradise. All that is an outcome of redemption. Now, how can I be so sure concerning that? Well, look now to verse 44. Now, verse 44 gives us a message, a sign a, a statement from God that's undeniable. That we're talking here about redemption. Why do I say that? Verse 44. And at about the sixth hour. Now, it doesn't say precisely. It uses a Greek word which means approximately. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, when it comes to time, approximately can be a wide variation of time. Now, I say that very seriously. Because another gospel says the third hour he was crucified. This is somewhat later. And at the sixth hour, well, what do we know? Well, the sixth hour, the day begins approximately, give or take, at six in the morning. When they begin this counting. And then the other way to count is to speak about the night watches. So at the sixth hour, and remember six, we're talking about redemption here. And what must be necessary for redemption is God's grace. And the number six relates to the grace of God. You say, where is that found in the Bible? Several places, but let me give you one. In the book of Isaiah... Remember when Isaiah, he sees that, that vision of heaven? And he hears that angelic proclamation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Well, we know that. But here's the, the new aspect. The whole world is going to be full of his glory. Good thing or bad thing? Well, Isaiah knew, wait a second, if all of his creation is going to be glorious, that leaves me out. I'm not glorious. Isaiah knew that he was 
a man of unclean lips, who dwelt among a people of unclean lips. So he says, whoa, this, this isn't good. Because if God's glory comes right now, it's going to consume me. I'm not holy. And then you have one of the, the angels. And they flew over. This one flew over. And what did he have? Six wings. And it was that six-wing angel that took, and we sung about that last night, took one of the coals, and he made atonement for Isaiah. He cleansed him. So this whole concept of six, it relates to a grace that cleanses, a grace that makes us acceptable to God, not by our merit, but by his provision. So we read verse 44, and it was approximately the sixth hour, the time when the sun would have been the highest. And what do we read? And darkness happened over all, completely over all the earth until the ninth. Now, the number nine has to do with, with an action, a result, a deed. Why do I say that? Well, Judaism teaches, and this is, is true, in the fact that a woman is pregnant for how many months? Nine months. And then the result. So here we're seeing the outcome. Grace brings about an outcome. And what is that outcome? Redemption. Why do I say that? Well, darkness, good thing or bad thing, our first thought is bad. But from a biblical standpoint, from a Torah perspective, sometimes darkness is very good. If you look sometime at Exodus chapter 12, what do we know about Exodus chapter 12? The whole chapter is about what? Passover. The exodus from Egypt. And it was at midnight that the time that there was darkness that God moved and he struck the Egyptians. And you're going to see in the scripture, for example, in the book of Esther, also in the book of Judges, we see that good things happen. God begins to move in a redemptive way to bring victory to his people. To bring about a change from bad to good. When? At midnight. That is under darkness. Think for a moment for the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12. When, when Peter was in prison, it was at midnight when that angel, and by the way, was Passover, right? It was at midnight that that angel came and brought Peter out of bondage. That is a description of redemption. So this darkness, in fact, the rabbis teach, without darkness, there will be no redemption. As the exodus from Egypt took place under darkness, so will the final redemption be. Now, what I believe is this. God says, I want them to know. And if they're teaching that darkness must accompany redemption, at the time that Yeshua was on that cross, when he was doing the work, the perfect work, the sufficient work of redemption, God says, to make this real clear to my people, miraculously, he caused, at the time that there should be light, he caused darkness over all the world. It's a sign of his redemption. So darkness came about on the whole earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened and was torn, the, the parochet, that is that veil, in the midst of the sanctuary. Now, we could spend many hours talking about the significance of that event. The, tail being, the veil being torn in two from the top to the bottom. Whenever anything happens from top to bottom in the Bible, it shows this is God. 
It is a heavenly source. And what's this torn veil? We have access by means of redemption to find grace at the throne of grace. So there's a great voice. Look at verse 46. Now, verse 46 really bother, bothers the scientists. Because, I mean, if the other stuff didn't, this is very problematic. Because Yeshua is on the cross. It's the ninth hour. What happens at the ninth hour he's going to? Die. Now, here's the problem. Many people teach that Yeshua died by crucifixion. That is not the case. It's not the case. He died on the cross. It's true that he was crucified. But he did not die by crucifixion. Why? Now, I've stayed away up until this time from mentioning names. I'm going to mention one person's name. Bill O'Reilly. He wrote a book, right? Killing Jesus. And if you've ever heard him be interview about it, well, let me tell you, a theologian, he's not. <laughs> he says, you know, what we read here, it's, it's just not, it didn't happen. It's not true. Because he says when someone dies by crucifixion, I mean, they become so weak that they can't breathe. And they suffocate. Now that's true. He's right on that. But Yeshua did not die by crucifixion. The scripture does not say that. He died upon the cross. He was crucified. But that's not what killed him. You remember? Because of the concern of, of the holiday, the first day of unleavened bread, the Jewish leadership says, hey, we can't have these bodies hanging on the tree. We can't have impurity during the holiday. So we need to take them down. Well, they went to the one on the right. Had he died? No. So they broke his leg so he could not push up in order to relieve the stress on his arms that would allow him to breathe. It would put his whole weight upon his arms and he wasn't strong enough to expand his lungs and breathe and he quickly died. So too with the second one. But when they came to Yeshua, he was already what? Dead. Why? He did not die by crucifixion. No, what we find here, look at what it says. Yeshua is totally in control. He gave the order for his arrest. He was in control of every aspect. Now he surrendered, but he was in control. And when the time was right for him to die, what happened? We see that God laid upon Yeshua, this one who never sinned, but was laid upon him, your sin and your sin and your sin and my sin, and all the sins of the world. And sin is synonymous with death, Sin is synonymous with separation. That's why he says in another gospel, O Lord, O Lord, why have you what? Forsaken. There was this separation because Yeshua became sin for us. And sin is related to death, and that's what brought about his end. Not crucifixion. He was crucified. But it was because of your sin and my sin that Yeshua died. It was then, at that time, look what the scripture says. And he, Yeshua, cried out. And what does the Bible say? A whisper. And a great voice. He wasn't near death by crucifixion. He spoke loudly. And what did he say? Well, we look here. He gives the order. Yeshua spoke, Father, into your hands I commit. Literally, I deliver over my spirit. And after saying these things, he breathed 
his last. He gave up his spirit. Now, one more verse, and we'll wrap up. In verse 47, we see that there is a centurion. Now, those who carried out crucifixion, I mean, they were not high-ranking Roman officials. But there would have been a centurion there, and there was. And he was probably the Roman official in Jerusalem that was over all crucifixions, over all executions by this manner. And this probably wasn't his first assignment. And what can we conclude about him? Well, we conclude that he saw numerous people die by crucifixion. And when he witnessed Yeshua crying out in that large, that great voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commit your spirit in a loud voice. And then he died. <laughs> this centurion, he knew that something unique happened. He knew that Yeshua was not just a mere man. Why? Well, in another gospel, he says, truly, this one is the Son of God. But in our account, it doesn't mean it's a conflict. It's for the purpose of revelation. What did he say? This one is truly, what's that word? Righteous. Righteous. What we see in the cross is the righteous one laying down his life, turning his life over to his heavenly father, suffering, being tortured. All for what purpose? Well, the scripture yells this out. For the purpose of redemption. So that you and I might become the purchase by his blood. The purchased possession of God the Father. So that we can learn now. And not just learn but have the anointing and the power and the discernment. To use ourselves as vessels of the Holy Spirit. And what does that Holy Spirit do? Remember what we learned last night. It gives us life. He gives us order. He gives us power. He gives us discernment so that we can walk faithfully in God's will. See, that's why Paul wanted to know Messiah and him crucified. Because Paul, he desired to walk with God. And if you don't know the cross, if you haven't experienced Messiah and Him crucified for you, then you have no hope of walking with God. You have no hope of experiencing redemption. You have no hope of being invited into the kingdom. Because the road to the kingdom comes through the cross.